Hello, investors and traders, and welcome to the Weekly Market Report. I'm AJ Monte, and this is a one-year daily candle chart of the iShares Trust, which is the ETF that tracks the Russell 2000. This is ticker symbol IWM, and as I do each and every week, I leave my lines on the chart from last week's report so you can see how the forecast worked out. Now, last Friday was right here, but remember, we had a shortened trading week this week where Monday the markets were closed in observance for Memorial Day. And this was the line that I drew in this downward direction. Now, I said we would most likely go down towards filling this gap. You can see we came within pennies of that gap. My low was 223.48. Yesterday, this hammer pattern showed up. We're very close to a hammer pattern, and it looks like we're bouncing off of that gap fill, which is now going to act as a support level. My gap fill rules are very clear because I repeat them almost every week, where 80% of the time gaps fill, and then once the gap fills, there's an 80% chance that the price will bounce. So that means if there is a gap to the downside, that gap support level will be right around there after the gap fills. So that is what we're seeing right now in the Russell 2000. If you take a look at where we could go next week, well, that means we could go a little bit higher only because the oscillators are starting to roll up. And so I'm not getting crazy bullish here by any stretch. I think we're going to just move up to retest this most recent high from this week. Now, ultimately, there is a resistance point right around 232. Yeah, we could even go that far, but I'm just doing a short-term upward target to a price level of 229.37. So that's IWM. If I take a look at the spiders, which is the S&P ETF, you can see again my lines were left on the chart. That one we hit spot on, where last Friday I drew that diagonal line saying we would most likely pull back to the 20-period moving average. I also highlighted this gap fill point as a possible support level. So now that this target is hit, I'm going to have to condense my price action because as you'll see from the VIX, the VIX is showing up with a red candle and that for the most part is inversely related. So I think next week we will break out into a new high for the S&P and then start to pull back. Again, we'll have a wide divergence at that point, but my upside price target now for SPY is 424.68. Now, with that said, let's go right to the VIX. This is a volatility index. It's more or less known as the fear index. So right now, as the markets are still pressing the highs, fear is dropping. Investors are feeling comfortable. Traders are feeling even more comfortable as they milk their profits on the way up. However, there is a key support level down here on the VIX, right around 1541. I think we could go right down to test that, but I'm going to just do this. I'm going to match this high right there. That's all I'm going to do. I'm leaving that in there, and I'm going to draw this parallel to it. This high is 2218. That's my ultimate price target for the VIX. Now, you option traders out there that want to trade the VIX, you can do that. There's options. You could trade the VXX. You, you pick the instrument, and I would also advise that if you do trade the VIX, do not make that a long-term buy-hold investment. It's a trading instrument. All right, so that's the VIX. Now, let's take a look at the Qs, QQQ. So NASDAQ ETF right there. We did not pull back all the way to the gap fill point, but guess what we did do? We pull back to the 20-period moving average, which now is acting as support. For the Qs, I think that resistance is going to hold up there. I'm going to erase this line, but I'm going to keep the parallel gap fill line in place. More or less, we are stuck in a range right here. I do think we could go higher, but I think we're going to stay in this range. I don't think we're going to break out of that high. This target price for next week, 339.37. But again, keep in mind that that downside gap is most likely going to act as a price magnet to draw prices lower. So that's for the Qs. Finally, let's go to the diamonds. This is ticker symbol DIA. The markets are stuck more or less in this tight trading range. The pullback didn't take place all the way, but we did pivot here on Tuesday, filled the gap. We pulled back. Moving average held this support. I'm still going to draw this support level 
as part of the sideways trading range that we are stuck in right here. I'll keep that price target in mind and move this on over. But I'm first going to draw a little bit of a test there of this high, then ultimately the pullback. Okay, so keep that in mind. For those option traders that are putting on diagonal spreads, this is a great market for that because we are trading put spreads and even if the market goes against you and the market moves up on a on a bearish put spread that you may have on the diagonal calendar spread you could still make money on the way up now if you're interested in learning more about how to do that obviously contact market rebellion and plug into some of my courses and and classes that i do especially the coaching classes that i do which are one-on-one -on -one. now that's the overall forecast for the market, but I want to leave you with this and the reasons why I'm still very much a long-term bear in this market. Take a look at this. This is from the Federal Reserve, more or less graphing the money supply, M1, in the velocity of money. If you've never heard of that term before, please study it. What's happened now is the velocity of our dollar has dropped to a level, the lowest level, in fact, in my lifetime. Look what's happened in one year so far. It's fallen off a cliff. What does this mean? Well, if I take $1 and spend it, that dollar goes to another person. That person may save it or spend it. If they spend it, it's passed on to another person. The rate at which dollars pass through the hands of consumers and those who earn in dollars is what is measured here. The faster the money moves, the stronger the economy. Think of it this way. Imagine for a moment that we have an engine. The U.S. economy is the engine. The money is the fuel going into that engine. And the Fed is the carburetor that controls the flow of money into the system. You following so far? So right now we have a lot of money being pumped into the system but it's not flowing through the hands of individuals. Why? Because there's a shift in our culture. People who are locked down and continue to stay locked down are not going to go to the movies and pass that dollar on for the popcorn. That person that is thinking about going out to the restaurant or to the bar to have a beer is most likely going to stay home and not pass that money on as a tip, let's say. So that money does not flow through the economy. It doesn't heat up the economy. It actually chokes the economy. Just like a carburetor gets too much fuel but not enough flow the engine's going to shut down. That's the best analogy that I can give you here. And that's exactly what we're seeing here in the velocity of money. Again, study that. It's very important that you understand how that works. You don't have to be an economist to figure this one out. Our economy is in trouble. Now, let's take a look at this screen right here, which represents payrolls. Now, in order for us to get back up to where we were and growth pre-pandemic, which represents this gold or yellow dotted line, we have to produce 1 million jobs each month, every month, for a year, year and a half, just to get back to pre-pandemic levels. Now, coupled with that, we have an open border. What does that mean? We have people flooding into this country who may not be paying taxes or most likely will not be paying taxes, and they're willing to work for jobs far less than minimum wage. Therefore, the job market, the labor pool is being affected by that. That will absolutely put a dent in these numbers moving forward, and that will also cripple our economy moving forward. Finally, take a look at this. This is more or less a heat map of national debt among countries around the world. This is absolutely mind-boggling. Here we are, the U.S. of A. We're at 133% of our GDP. We're actually creeping up on Belize right here. How many of you have been to Belize? Now, granted, the U.S. economy is much larger. It's one of the largest, if not the largest economy in the world. What happens when our debt surpasses the gross domestic product? And revenues for taxes drop because we have people not paying taxes or people not spending their money. And sales tax and sales tax revenues drop. Who's going to pay for the debt? We are in a black hole, folks. This is what I'm talking about. So for all you folks that think the markets are not going to go down and continue to comment on those who take short positions, you're doing yourself a big disservice and maybe even putting yourself into financial harm's way by ignoring this. This is something that should not be 
ignored. Now, if you'd like to learn more about what we do here at Market Rebellion, just click on the description box below. There are links down there that will help you read charts such as this and learn how to manage risk. And we are working our hardest to keep up with the demand that we're seeing lately, especially. So thank you so much for following. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you soon. So long.